All right. Um, yeah, my name is Kevin. And today, I'm really excited actually to be talking about key transparency, which is something that we announced in April uh, of this year, and we're in the process of rolling out. Um, all right, so let's get started. So um, WhatsApp is considered an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app, and the way that end-to-end -end encrypted, the, the end -end encrypted messaging works in general is basically that you have two people who want to communicate who can first do so by getting each other's public keys, and then once they have each other's public keys, they can run a key exchange protocol to establish a secure session between them so that no one except for the endpoints of the session is able to decrypt its contents. And what this means is that the server who sits in between these two users is gonna keep a mapping of, say, user identifiers like phone numbers, in the case of WhatsApp, to their public keys and distribute them on requests. So for example, if Alice wants to contact Bob for the first time on WhatsApp, then she's gonna enter Bob's phone number into WhatsApp, and the server will return Bob's public key. And now at this point, it's really important for the security session that WhatsApp actually gives the correct public key corresponding to Bob. So for instance, if WhatsApp were to give a public key corresponding to some other private key that they've already generated, then this would effectively allow the server to run a man-in-the-middle attack on the session between Alice and Bob. And the way that most end-to-end -end encrypted messaging apps today address this um, is by exposing some sort of like manual verification of public keys for users. And the way this works is that you can basically agree to meet up in person or over a Zoom call um, and scan a QR code with your contact. And this QR code is constructed um, as basically like a hash of the public keys for both users. Right? And so with this current approach, there are several issues. One, which is that these codes are gonna change every time you get a new device, or in some implementations, if you like add a new device to your account, then this code is gonna reset because there might be like a separate public key associated with it. Um, and also, if you imagine having like a large group chat with your family of, of like 10 people or something like that, then technically, in order to have this like full end-to-end -end encryption guarantee, you would have to do this QR code scanning business with all the members in the group chat, not just once. Um, and you know, factor that in with people changing devices, it can be pretty infeasible to expect that you know, um, people are going to be constantly checking this or uh, doing the scan um, in person. And in particular, often the situations where this matters the most are the situations where meeting in person wouldn't be possible. Um, so as an example, so say you're like an anonymous whistleblower that wants to reach out to a journalist in a country that's controlled by an authoritarian government, then you can't really rely on this key verification feature at the moment in end-to-end -end encrypted messaging apps, assuming you can't meet up in person, um, to have the assurance that you're actually talking to this journalist and not some undercover agent that was able to convince WhatsApp to serve you the wrong public key. And so this is where key transparency comes in. And key transparency has been proposed as a solution to address this problem. And the basic idea is that um, we want to provide a means for doing contact verification in a more automatic way without requiring users to meet up in person. And instead, the server is going to basically uh, periodically make a public commitment to this database of public keys and then allow users to cryptographically verify that the server is actually distributing these public keys consistently. And for example, the server can say commit to this database of phone numbers of public keys at some time t, and then Alice can check her public key in this database against this commitment and verify that it's what she expects. And then later on, if Bob were to query for Alice's public key for the same commitment, then the server would be forced to present the same key that Alice had already verified to Bob. And this makes the verification process automatic because although we're still relying on the server as an intermediary for message passing, um, we have this cryptographic mechanism in place now to prevent the server from inconsistently serving public keys. Okay, so at a really high level, I'm gonna try to go over some of the details behind how key transparency works, how we actually get, get, have these guarantees. Um, and so the idea is that for registration, the server is gonna maintain some sort of Merkle tree um, where the leaves of the tree represent versions of each key update ha that, that have happened for every user ever. So imagine if we have a billion users and they've updated their key three times each, then we're gonna have like three billion leaves in this Merkle tree. And then the tree is gonna be organized in a way where we basically keep hashing two neighboring nodes until we have like a single root hash at the top of the tree, um, which represents a commitment to the entire database of all updates um, to all keys. 
And then we have this notion of epochs um, for publishing where we're gonna wait and collect all updates that have happened in the past five minutes, for example, and then announce a new epoch and publish something called an epoch receipt to some public endpoint that anyone on the internet ideally can read from. And so these epoch receipts that we publish are gonna contain three things. There is gonna be a new version number associated with the epoch. There is a new public root hash of the latest state of the Merkle tree. And then there's something called an audit proof or an append only proof, which is a proof that the Merkle tree um, in this current epoch was derived consistently from the Merkle tree in the previous epoch and in an append only manner and in particular without having deleted any history that was recorded or changing any old values. And these epoch receipts are published um, so that anyone can verify that we're managing these keys honestly. And what's really important also about this is that these receipts don't contain any like, sensitive information or a PII like the phone numbers or even the public keys themselves. And finally, now for handling lookup requests using key transparency, Bob first reach, reaches out to this public internet endpoint to get the latest published epoch um, and also this root hash associated with the epoch. And then Bob will ask WhatsApp to provide the latest copy of Alice's key that matches this root hash. And WhatsApp servers can then use the internal Merkle tree representation to not only return the appropriate key for Alice, but also an inclusion proof that Bob can verify, which will assert to him that Alice's key is actually included in the Merkle tree whose hash matches what he asked for. Okay, so I know that was a really quick and high level overview of key transparency. Um, I wanna switch up to talking to, uh, about some of the challenges that we faced while deploying key transparency in practice. So one thing is the consistent distribution of these root hashes. So basically all of this cryptographic verification that users do is always gonna be against a public commitment. So the Merkle tree you can see of as kind of just reducing the problem of consistently serving like a constantly mutating database to consistently serving a single 32 byte hash that we keep updating every five minutes. But we still need some way to distribute these hashes consistently. And ideally what we would do is we would put it on some sort of like distributed trusted quorum like infrastructure like a blockchain, um, which also supports an easy way for clients to verify that um, the things we post on it are actually valid. Um, and we don't do that. What we do for now is we basically have this like internal service which holds a signing key and a counter. Um, and whenever we publish a new epoch, we ping this service with a new root hash and it bumps this internal counter and then gives us a signature with a guarantee that they only give us like one signature per epoch and we serve the signature down to clients. So basically, if you can trust that we're running the service this way, um, then each signature attests to the fact that there's only one root hash that was signed for each epoch, which would essentially kind of mitigate the server equivocation. But critically, it, requ it requires that you trust that we're running this internally. So we would love to have a way to have externally verifiable, uh, or, or some, some externally ver verifiable way to run this service. The second challenge is the following. So right now, with the way I've described key transparency, we have the guarantee that if Alice and Bob like, are online at the same time and happen to check in the same epoch for each other's keys, then we have this nice consistency guarantee. But in practice, it's unreasonable to expect that like, users will be checking during the same epoch or users will always be online constantly checking for, their, for each other's keys. And so what we ideally want is a guarantee of consistency that works across epochs. And one way to handle this that has been suggested in the academic literature um, is to allow for something called key history checks for users. And the idea is that users can periodically audit the history of their own key changes um, and then do lookup checks on their contacts keys, right? So that way I'm checking that WhatsApp has been always representing my key correctly and they didn't do some sort of like, you know, like first it's valid and then for a brief window it's invalid and then they switch it back to, to it being valid. Um, and, and yeah, and then if everyone, so if everyone's checking their own history, then we can all check for just the latest version of our contacts keys, and then we kind of have like the nice guarantee that we would ideally have for key transparency. The problem is that in our current appointment, um, we haven't really found a good way to surface like the history of key changes for users for multiple reasons. One, it's not something that we necessarily expect that people would remember the last time they changed their devices or you know, really be able to make use of that information. Um, so this is something that we're also currently working on. Right now we have kind of a stopgap solution which is to uh, allow for like doing dual lookup proofs. So like I'm gonna check the latest version of my key and the latest version of my contacts key. And yeah, w w we have some thoughts for how we wanna support history but they're something that we're still working on. Okay, 
Um, I'm going to skip this slide. There's a lot of related work that we surveyed in terms of the actual deployment and how we construct the Merkle trees. Um, there's, yeah, I, this I won't have time to cover, but um, we can talk about it later if you're interested. Okay, so on the deployment side, I want to so I, I want to wrap up with just talking about some of the considerations we made for implementing key transparency in practice. Um, so. One, just to give a sense of the scale of the deployment here, right now, so we've been publishing epochs kind of in the background, but haven't enabled the UI just yet. And right now, we have about 50,000 epochs that we've published. And um, overall, this is like 20 billion or more nodes of this gigantic Merkle tree that we're keeping server side. Um, and our publish frequency is set to about once every five minutes. And you can expect that every five minutes, we add about 100,000 new entries to this Merkle tree. And one kind of interesting thing to note here is that our publish operation, um, you know, we have to, our, our goal is to publish every five minutes, which means that the amount of time it takes to index this database needs to be less than five minutes, or like a lot less than five minutes. <laughs> and so in terms of like the practicality of these systems, a lot of times, um, I guess in other deployments, we've heard issues with like being able to manage the state of these Merkle trees and all that. And so that's something that we definitely focus on a lot for our implementation, and it, it helps to guide our choices for like the algorithmic aspect of things or like how we actually organize the Merkle tree. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to mention was one big downside of um, the current implementation um, is that our audit proofs are really large. So um, I mentioned that we're going to be publishing these epoch receipts every five minutes. Right now, because the audit proofs essentially, well, there's some detail in it that, that I didn't cover how they're constructed, but right now they're like hundreds of megabytes. Um, and it's not really feasible to expect that everyone's just going to go down on hundreds of megabytes to, to verify that we're running this properly. Maybe for some power users they would, but um, we would love to figure out ways to shrink this. Okay, and then last slide. Um, we have all this is open source. We have a library called AKD, which um, which we've published, which is basically, which is actually exactly how we're running key transparency today within WhatsApp. In fact, we can use it to verify our audit proofs because it, it contains the same logic, not only for generating the proofs, but for verifying them. And our hope with open sourcing this is A, that other encrypt, other end-to-end encrypted messaging apps will consider also deploying key transparency. And twofold, um, there are a lot of academic papers which propose new key transparency designs and they run benchmarks on things, but when we were trying to analyze them in practice, they didn't work at the scale of like billions of users. So what we're hoping for is to provide like an easy way for people to run benchmarks or tweaks to the algorithm and, and like use that in papers to say, oh, and here's how it performs against WhatsApp's implementation. All right, that's all the time I have. Thank you so much.